Today I'm here to talk to you about farm fences. Anytime you have an agricultural system that are going to buy in livestock, animals and crops, you need some way to separate them. Here in North America, we have farm fences as early as 1632. Now, it changes the paradigm in the old world. In the old world, you had to fence animals in. In the new world, there's so much land, you got to fence them out. So, if you're going to build a fence, it's going to determine by what's the purpose, how much material you have, and how much time and effort you want to take to build that fence. The easiest fence you can build is a Virginia worm fence. Take 10 to 12 foot long poles, stack them in a zigzag pattern, and let gravity hold it together. A modification of that Virginia worm fence would be a stake and rider fence. Take that same zigzag pattern, now put a stake at the end and a large rail on top of it, gravity will hold it in place. As late as 1870, this is the most popular fence in America. It's considered the American fence. Now, the only fence that can compete with that would be the post and rail. Post and rail fences took some work. You had to auger holes in to make room for the rails, and you had to dig fence post holes. You actually save some space, and they tend to last longer. The other kind of fence that are very common are going to be these stone walls that you see. Farmers will clear their fields, they'll take these stones, and they'll pile them at the edge of their fields or along boundaries. Now, we can combine fences. We can take this stone wall and we can put a stake and rider fence on top, which makes it horse high and hog tight. And then the last fence would be like a picket fence. Think about a white washed little fence around a, a, a vegetable garden around a farmhouse. Now, in the Civil War, whether you're a West Point general or a Civil War soldier, Firing fences are part of the tactical terrain of the Civil War battlefield, and they really impact us in four ways. They are concealment, they're cover, they're obstacles, and they also have a, a factor in command and control, and we'll break this down. Concealment. Concealment's about breaking the line of sight, hiding. We have a great example here at Gettysburg. Uh, Brigadier General Alfred Iverson's brigade suffers the highest percentage casualties of any Confederate brigade here at Gettysburg, in part because Union soldiers concealed behind a stone wall will rise up and deliver a deadly flanking fire on Iverson's men cover. Cover's a lot like concealment, but now you got to think about hiding. I think one of the best examples we have of concealment are Confederates using the stone wall at the base of Marie's Heights during the Fredericksburg battlefield in December of 1862. Next, we have fences as obstacles. Think about long linear formations coming across these fields. When they run into fences, they slow their momentum down, they sap their energy as they either have to knock them down or take them apart. For an enemy who can keep those fences under fire, they will inflict more casualties. Maybe the greatest example is here at Gettysburg, Union soldiers firing at Confederates, trying to negotiate the post and rail fences on either side of the Emmitsburg Road during what we know as Longstreet's assault or Pickett's Charge. Lastly, and perhaps most informally, is in command and control. With these units out here using linear formations, that we have long lines of fences that they can orient their men on. As they take them from column of march into line of battle, or if they're falling back, they can rally behind a fence that also provides some cover and concealment as an added benefit. So as we study the Civil War, we can think about farm fences as a simple tool, and in part they are. But for the Civil War soldier, they were an obstacle we considered deliberately or negotiated reactively in the heat of battle.